Hello, and welcome back to the Record of Arms. I'm your host, Mark Seven, and as always, I'm glad you decided to join me today for another discussion of military history. Today, we're going to cover a different topic than the Second World War air campaigns with our first series was concerned. We're going to focus instead on the state of the Spanish military in the summer of 1936. This was the eve of the military uprising, which would bring an end to the Second Spanish Republic, and initiate a three-year bloodbath, which would eventually involve most of the great powers of the European continent. I have a few sources for this one. For general information, I'll be drawing from two of the best journal histories in English. These are the works of Anthony Beaver and Hugh Thomas, both titled simply The Spanish Civil War. For more specific information on the organization and culture of the Spanish military, I'll be using the excellent Politics in the Military in Modern Spain by Stanley G. Payne, a scholar whom I have found to be one of the most useful authorities on the subject, at least in English. So now with that said, let's take a look at the tempestuous Spain of the 1930s. As the various actors there attempt to navigate the political terra incognita left after the long delayed collapse of the discredited, moth eaten, monarchical government. On the 14th of April, 1931, the King of Spain, Alfonso XIII, stepped down from the throne. This brought an end to the Spanish Bourbon dynasty, the culmination of a process of breakdown that had been ongoing since the beginning of the 19th century. Not only the monarchy, but the powers that be in general in the country had suffered a gradual loss of confidence that it became critical in the 1920s. And no wonder, as most of the population had labored during the previous century under an array of national problems that the establishment had proven itself incapable of competently addressing, much less solving. Worse still, they appeared to have retreated into a very entrenched and obstinate conservatism which opposed clearly necessary reform. As a result, Spaniards had sought relief from their grievances and avenues outside the political process. Most obvious of these are the recurrent revolts of the ultra-conservative Carlos in the Northwest, but less spectacular challenges to the Spanish state and its underlying power structure had occurred all throughout the country, ranging from regional separatist movements to armed industrial trade union organizations. The inability of the state to effectively control or suppress these movements further decreased its standing in the eyes of the people. The creation of a paramilitary police force, the Civil Guard, in response to the increasing resistance to the established order in the countryside, was a confession of the state and army's inability to control the situation. However, the introduction of these militarized police units into the Spanish domestic political arena proved counterproductive, as they quickly earned a reputation for brutality that only served to alienate the mass of the ordinary Spanish people further. This heinous reputation would only grow with time. So hated were the civil guards that when, on New Year's Day of 1932, they attempted to use force to prevent a village meeting regarding a dispute with the local landlords and political bosses in the tiny hamlet of Castablanco, they were set upon by the citizens and hacked to pieces. When the authorities moved in to punish the perpetrators, the entire community refused to name names and insisted on taking their punishment collectively. This episode captures much of the character of the civil strife that took place in the countryside, where a very definite us-versus-them mentality existed between the forces of the established order and the impoverished mass of the population. The veneer of normality was more or less successfully draped over the decaying Spanish political situation in the latter decades of the 19th century by the establishment of a constitutional monarchy. This system was known as the Restoration System, or sometimes the Canavite System, after its architect, statesman, Canovas de Castillo. It featured a two-party system of so-called liberals and conservatives participating in a parliamentary system of ministries and legislature below the overall presidency of the monarch. In reality, the entire system was a sham, the stage managed elections, yielding a regular rotation of one party in power and followed by the other, both in service of the Spanish Conservative Coalition of Church, Capitalist, and Landowner. This predictable alternation of so called liberal and conservative governments was sometimes called the Torno Rigoroso, and it represented little more than the sharing of power of two barely distinguishable factions of the ruling class. In theory, however, it was a democratic system, but the economic and social realities that lay behind it negated any true representation of the public will. For example, Poor could vote, but they were under the effective control of local leaders who could bring legal or economic coercion to bear against those who voted against the wishes of their betters. Despite its numerous defects, this system was in fact successful at bringing an end to the very chaotic conditions and civil disorders that had plagued Spain earlier in the century. The stability it created allowed a great deal of economic growth and modernization that had so far eluded Spain to finally take place. However, the cynical nature of the regime was plain for all, both at home and abroad, to see. Worse, it was only able to maintain this precarious order by resolutely ignoring or suppressing demands to address increasingly critical national problems. The growth and prosperity of the period 1870 to 1920 brought much of Spain and Spanish life into the Industrial Age. However, 
It also brought with it the problems typical of modernity. In industrial capital, labor struggles became a major factor in the main industrial areas of Vizcaya and Catalonia. Violence centered on the labor struggles intensified as the industries grew and drew more landless peasants into the urban labor force, swelling the populations of cities such as Barcelona and creating the first genuine Spanish urban proletariat. Working class organizations appeared and grew, ranging from moderate socialist to Stalinist, along with a very strong and well-organized anarcho-syndicalist movement. These militant unions attracted tens of thousands of laborers to their ranks. The anarchists had large numbers of organized adherents not only in the cities, but also among the landless agricultural laborers working in the enormous estates of the southern agricultural provinces, such as Andalusia, Extremadura, and La Mancha. Some of these groups were openly revolutionary, and many included organized militia elements created to resist repression at the hands of strikebreakers hired by capital or by the state security forces themselves. Gun battles between pistoleros, who were company thugs, and armed workers were frequent in the streets of Barcelona, paralleling the recurrent violence in the countryside. During this period of prolonged national crisis, the army played a vital part, and one that changed its institutional ethos and political role. While the monarchy and the politicians of all kinds lost the trust of the people due to the events of the first part of the 19th century, the army gained in popular esteem. The humiliation of the monarchy and the political leadership at the hands of Napoleon in 1808 was not shared by the soldiers. He played a very much glorified part in the national myth of resistance to the French occupation that was created out of the memory of the Napoleonic campaigns in the peninsula. In the unstable decades following the expulsion of Napoleon's lieutenants, the army intervened repeatedly in Spanish political life. This took the form of the pronunciamiento, a term referring to a quick coup in which a clique of generals deposed the civil government, implemented some necessary reform, often quite a progressive one, and withdrew from power to allow the new government to function. The monarchical and republican governments which the army kicked out of power in this way were dysfunctional and unpopular, and as a result the coups were not generally resented by the Spanish people. In fact, they very much enhanced the patriotic prestige held by the military, which many Spaniards credited with stepping in and saving the country from the folly of the civil rulers. Therefore, throughout most of the 19th century, the military was the one part of the Spanish establishment that was widely held in good esteem. In fact, the army began to be regarded by many Spaniards, and above all by the soldiers themselves, as the true repository and safeguard of the national patrimony, standing above the government and representing the true Spain, whoever may legally be in charge. This change in perception led to an internalization on the part of the officers themselves, who began to take this role of true guardian of the political life and integrity of the Spanish nation to heart, and relegate to a secondary role that of deterring foreign aggression or fighting against foreign armies in general. This change was made against the not insignificant background of a series of Spanish military disasters that characterized her 19th century experience. Indeed, aside from the resistance to Napoleon's lieutenants in the first two decades, the record of Spanish arms in the 19th century is a story of repeated defeat, punctuated by occasional catastrophe. Most important was the loss of the overseas empire, with the exception of a few enclaves along the coast of northwest Africa. This process of loss culminated in the total defeat of the Navy and colonial forces in the Caribbean and Philippines at the hands of the emerging United States in 1898. Worse still, the new century brought little improvement. The army suffered a string of humiliations and failures in its efforts to control the inhabitants of the Moroccan territory left to them. These setbacks reached an awful climax in the greatest disaster to fall Spanish arms in hundreds of years, the massacre of Spanish forces at Anwal in August 1921. That this terrible blow was dealt by an enemy which the sensibility of the time would have considered a semi-civilized native power did little to mitigate its warping effect on the pride of many Spanish officers. A belief began to grow among certain ambitious officers that the blame for the manifest weakness and incompetence of the Spanish army was properly placed on a failure of the civilian government and of the civilians themselves to provide the soldiers proper support. The loss of these imperial commitments greatly simplified the Spanish strategic situation, however. Now, with very little left over which to quarrel with her neighbors, Furthermore, did not appear to cover her home territory. Spain's need to defend herself against foreign aggression became so remote that the army could allow itself to be absorbed in its new political role without exposing the nation to dismemberment at the hands of its enemies. The army's record in the later 19th century as a domestic political force is surprisingly mixed. Many long overdue innovations in Spanish political life were imposed by the military in the course of successive pronunciamentos. A great deal of political and social progress which pulled Spanish practice from medievalism to modernity was accomplished in this way by reforming generals apparently genuinely acting out of a sense of guardianship for the Spanish nation. However, a multitude of factors make it in the nature of such interventions to act in such a way as to retard social change and progress. As a result, the army gradually lost the goodwill it had built up in many quarters and became identified with the obstinate do-nothingism of the Canavite system, 
which it had helped to establish and maintain. This was further aggravated by the extremely unpopular practice of conscription and such petty legal measures as the 1906 Law of Jurisdictions. This measure was passed by a subservient parliament at military insistence, following reverses in Morocco and subsequent criticism in the press. It made such satire of the army offense for which civilians could be tried and sentenced by military courts martial. This absurd indicator of the very touchy pride of some Spanish officers was to remain in force for the next 25 years till the end of the monarchy. Nevertheless, the army was still less discredited than the government, and when the restoration system finally collapsed under its own dead weight, the king turned to the army to rule in his name and invited one of the more prominent generals, Don Miguel Primo de Rivera, to take over the government as military dictator. His rule lasted from 1923 until the end of the decade. Under the regime of this relatively benevolent strongman, some surprisingly progressive and politically unpopular attempts were made to deal with some pressing social issues. For example, arbitration boards were set up to settle capital labor relations in the industrial areas, and by the dictator's order, the socialists and their allies were given a strong voice in these councils. Despite these efforts, however, the dictator proved no more able to manage the increasingly troubled situation in the country. Having lost the faith not only of the people, but also of his fellow officers, Primo de Rivera stepped down in January of 1930. Perhaps ironically, the experience of military rule had the effect of further disillusioning the more politically active sections of the army leadership with the established order. In their view, the army had become alienated from the nation, to which it now stood in some sense opposed. This is a very dangerous development, as events would soon show. The monarchy didn't long outlast Primo de Rivera. The monarchy had fatally shared in the disgrace of the dictator, who was, after all, the king's creature. The king's subsequent appointment of other military figures to form governments did little to improve matters. Few regretted the loss of King Alfonso XIII when the monarch, not wanting to become a symbol for one side or the other in the political combat surrounding him, made his way out of the country and out of Spanish history altogether. The progressive political organizations that had been working towards this moment seized their chance, and the Second Spanish Republic was proclaimed on 14th of April 1931. A wave of euphoria swept over the country, uniting the bulk of the people in enthusiastic hopes for the future. Now, it seemed, Spain would finally be able to throw off the dead weight of her past and take her proper place among the ranks of the modern, secular, and industrializing states of Europe. We will turn to the character, organization, and equipment of the army inherited by the Second Republic shortly. For now, I'd like to emphasize that the policies enacted by the Republic in this early honeymoon period were in general much more progressive than the ideas held by the average Spaniard, and they were implemented in a way which antagonized large and influential sections of the population. The first Prime Minister of the Republic, the radical intellectual Emmanuel Azana, made no secret of his belief that it was his job to clear away the repressive order inherited from the monarchy. This rested on the two pillars of church and army and he intended to reduce each to what he and his supporters saw as their proper place in a modern, secular European society. Church he saw as having no legitimate place in public life at all. Successive laws enacted by the Republic removed education and all other public responsibilities, such as marriage, from their ecclesiastical authority. The Jesuit order was also disestablished. As for the army, reforms were carried through which aimed to reduce the bloated size of the officer corps and redefine the limits of military jurisdiction, particular by rolling back the restrictions on criticism of the army and the press imposed by the 1906 Law of Jurisdictions mentioned before. These and other reforms implemented by the Azania regime were sound ideas in a modernizing sense, and probably increased the efficiency of the Spanish army as a military force. The problem of the oversized, superannuated officer corps had long been a problem in the Spanish military, but this had become critical in recent years. Much of the military budget went to pay the salaries and pensions of officers with obsolete ideas and little to offer the country in terms of military efficiency. This was one reason why the Spanish military budget, which consumed a relatively high proportion of the national income, yielded so little in terms of effective fighting power. Also, the large number of older, superfluous officers served to block or slow down promotion of able junior officers and to inhibit the growth of the core of non-commissioned officers. However, these reforms were implemented in a way which was calculated to emphasize the intention of depoliticizing the military and redefining its status as similar to that of the other branches of the civil service. Many officers animated by the idea of the army's role as guardian of the true Spanish tradition perceived this as antagonistic, and this increased the gap between the constitutional authority and the army which had resulted in the Primo de Rivera dictatorship. Worse still, another important principle of the army's domestic political role that of maintaining the territorial unity of the Spanish state, was threatened by the law ceding limited degrees of self-government to the regions of the country with widespread separatist movements. These were the provinces of Catalonia and Vizcaya, 
latter commonly known as the Basque Country. Both of these provinces were located in the regions abutting the Pyrenees along the French frontier. Both were inhabited by peoples with distinctive linguistic, cultural, and historical traditions different than those of the dominant Castilian Spanish people. These were also the economically and industrially most modern parts of Spain, and the seat of her domestic armaments industry, and this only compounded the soldiers' anxiety. These fears would lead to a premature attempt to reverse the course of reform, when disaffected elements of the army attempted what might have been a pronunciamento in the old style in 1932. Ayunta's senior generals united around the Rift War veteran Jose Sanjurio attempted to oust the Republic. However, the coup found little support and achieved nothing. The almost casual response of the Republic to the failed uprising implied that they found in it little cause for alarm. Relatively lenient treatment of the principals involved, few of whom suffered harsh penalties, seemed to give hope that a new paradigm of order and moderation had in fact been established. Unfortunately, the honeymoon period of the new government had just about come to an end. The process of polarization and consequent radicalization was too deeply rooted in Spanish politics to allow for long-term support of a progressive agenda. Few Spaniards were genuinely enthusiastic about a left-leaning government, or even parliamentary government itself, and as the Republic began to fall short of the unrealistic hopes that it attended its inauguration, the narrow basis of its support became more and more obvious. A decisive step towards the destabilization of the new government took place when a conservative majority was returned by the 1933 parliamentary elections. To many on the left, the main conservative party, the CEDA, or the CEDA, represented nothing less than outright fascism. While this view is an exaggeration, this party of right-wing Catholics and moneyed interests was pushed in the direction of support for fascism by the same process of radicalization that was happening on the left. Formation of a government which included CEDA members and ministry positions, as a result of this election, triggered another event which shows that the lack of enthusiasm for parliamentary government was not limited to the backwards-looking right. Refusing to accept the results of the election, a coalition of leftist parties and labor organizations launched another revolt against the Republic. In 1934, this large leftist coalition declared a nationwide general strike. This failed to gain support and petered out almost immediately everywhere except for in the northern mining districts of the Asturias, the mountainous region just south of the Cantabrian coast, where organized mine workers armed themselves and took control of key areas. The government was hesitant to send the conscript forces into the area to suppress the revolt, for fear that they may side with the miners, and brought in the hardened troops from the units in the African territories, including the notoriously brutal soldiers of the Tercio under the leadership of Francisco Franco, to put down the revolutionary movement. This was done in a hard-fought campaign that upheld and extended the reputation for ferocious savagery of this colonial infantry. The tenacious Asturians, armed and organized by communist and anarchist organizers, and armed with rifles and explosives made of diamonds seized from the mining companies, faced the best of the Spanish army in battle conditions, and were only put down after a struggle lasting longer than two weeks. As a military organization, little of importance would change to the Army of the Republic between the 1934 revolt and the 1936 uprising. So, with this background in mind, let's take a closer look at its composition, organization, and equipment. We'll examine it as it was in July 1936, in the weeks before the fighting broke out. It would be out of this army that the forces of the contending sides of the Civil War would develop. The Spanish army in 1936 had a strength on paper of approximately 135,000 officers and men. 100,000 of these were stationed in Spain itself, including those stationed on the Balearic and Canary Islands. The units here were composed overwhelmingly of conscripts serving their mandatory one-year term of national service. Army life in Spain was boring, and the monotony of garrison life was only punctuated at odd intervals by deployments in support of the civil authorities. Pay was low, even for most officers and widespread corruption meant that much of the money and equipment intended for the men disappeared into someone's pockets somewhere along the way. Weapons and other equipment were old and usually in a poor state of repair. The same corruption makes it difficult to know for certain how many men were actually under arms at this time, as unit strengths were often reported as higher than they actually were, and the extra places left vacant so that the budget for the absent soldiers' pay and upkeep could be siphoned off, usually by staff, quartermasters, or commanding officer. The lot of the conscript soldier in the Spanish army was a harsh one, or one could expect to be cheated on pay and provisions, builded in terrible conditions, and to experience arbitrary, cruel, and unfair treatment. But for the most part, the plight of the Spanish conscript was an ordeal of neglect rather than danger. Most conscripts seemed to have apathetically waited out their terms. The officer corps was another matter. This was one of the few avenues of social mobility in Spanish society, and this led to the bloated, inefficient officer corps, which was one of the persistent ills of the 19th and early 20th century Spanish army. 
The reforms carried out by the Azania government reduced this problem somewhat, but even so, the 1936 army had 13,000 officers on the list. This figure amounts to one officer for every 10 men, an absurdly high figure for a modern army. The 1931 figure, predating the Azania measures, is even more extreme. 2,576 officers were on the active list that year, or one for every six or seven men. The great majority of these officers were older men, with little combat experience or even much interest in military matters. Colonels under 55 and majors below 40 were uncommon. This meant not only that outdated methods were commonly in use, but that the more motivated and competent junior officers faced long waits for promotion. In short, the picture that the Spanish army in the peninsula makes at this time is one of a thoroughly corrupt and unmotivated force, with little training or technical competence, and led by officers whose tactical and strategic thinking was often typical of the era before the Great War. Such poor fighting material were the formations of the peninsular army that the paramilitary police units of the Civil Guard and the Assault Guards were often found to be more liable in combat when the revolt came. The Spanish army in Africa was a different story. This force consisted of about 35,000 men, almost all of whom were stationed in the territory of Spanish Morocco. This small region across the Straits of Gibraltar opposite Sueta was the only significant oversized territory left to Spain, and it was populated by a warlike and troublesome population. A protracted and difficult war against resistance to Spanish rule here had progressed on and off throughout the first decades of the 20th century, culminating in the brutal Rift War of the 1920s. Though the campaigns against the Riffian insurgency had come to an end in 1927, and with it widespread resistance to Spanish rule, Clashes with bands of Moroccan fighters, sometimes organized into large, mobile striking units known as harkas, were not an uncommon occurrence. Spanish army units here were mostly long-service, professional career soldiers rather than conscripts, and the officers here were the best that Spain had. Spanish forces in Morocco were better trained than the rest of the army, and many had battlefield experience, which made them unique among Spanish soldiers. However, this should not be read to imply a level of military skill that put them in an elite category. The veteran Spanish forces here were an elite not so much of military competence as of aggression and determination. Their military skill itself was likely not out of the ordinary for similar European forces of the period, but in the Spanish context they were without doubt in a class of their own. This geographical split was mirrored by a political divide between the officers of the mainland units and those in Africa based on career interests and prospects. These groups came into conflict over the issue of promotion. Usually a promotion in the Spanish army was strictly on a basis of seniority. However, the low standard of ability displayed among the officers serving in the colony, which was ruthlessly exposed in the course of the Rift War, led to the expedient use of battlefield promotions of officers and enlisted men of proven ability. This led to bottlenecks in the normal course of seniority-based promotion and a perception that many young officers so breveted had jumped the line. Officers in mainland garrisons organized themselves into so-called Juntas de Defensa, which were little more than pressure groups intended to defend their interests in terms of promotion, which were, in effect, their career interests. The colonial officers who received these battlefield promotions were often the most active and ambitious officers in the service. In general, they had volunteered to serve in the units exposed to combat in Morocco and exhibited a genuine military professionalism. They understandably felt aggrieved that their dustbound colleagues, safe and sound in downtown Seville or some similar posts of safety, begrudged them the rank they had earned in the field at the risk of their lives. This dispute lasted throughout the post-1898 years and created a separate interest group within the army of these colonial officers. Known as the Africanistas, these officers, who in many ways were the cream of the Spanish military, or at least the most competent and motivated, would serve as the kernel of military discontent with the powers that be. Most of the leadership of the 1936 coup, as well as most of the army leadership that remained loyal to the Second Republic, were drawn from the ranks of the Africanistas which were filled with seasoned combat veterans from the Moroccan campaigns of the 1920s. These men and their beliefs had been shaped by the bitter fighting there as well as by the political controversy surrounding it. Bitterness among the officers serving in Morocco was growing. These men felt that they were held in contempt by an ungrateful nation which did not recognize their sacrifices for the national interests of all Spaniards. This was one of the chief motivations behind the alienation of the Africanistas from the Primo de Rivera dictatorship. Though the general's regime was able to bring the seemingly unwinnable Moroccan war to a victorious conclusion, he made it clear that in his opinion, Spanish Morocco wasn't worth the trouble it caused. He even proposed trading it for Gibraltar or some similar territory on more than one occasion. To many among the Africanistas, this was tantamount to betrayal, not only of them and their sacrifice, but also of the essential mission of the Spanish military, which is the protection and preservation of Spain's national honor and her historic patrimony. Outside of the army, popular opinion of the Africanistas varied. 
To traditionalists and conservatives, they were national heroes, defending the honor of Spain and carrying on her historical civilizing mission in demanding circumstances. Many other Spaniards, on the other hand, saw them as nothing more than a pack of bloody-minded warmongers, terrorizing and antagonizing the Moroccans in the interests of domestic tyrants and foreign capitalists, and perpetuating a pointless war in which their conscripted sons were sacrificed to a vainglorious idea of empire whose time had long since passed. In terms of military effectiveness, the veteran units stationed in the Moroccan territory were hands down the best combat troops available to the Spanish. These were based on the hard core of the Spanish Foreign Legion, also known as the Tercio and the Regulares, who were indigenous Moroccan soldiers recruited from among the Spaniards' recent enemies among the Moroccan population. These will be covered in greater detail later on, but for now let's take a look at the main structures of the Spanish army. Two major divisions, that of the forces in Spain itself, or the Peninsular Army, and that of colonial forces, or the Army of Africa, are distinct enough to require separate treatment. Let's begin with the Peninsular Army. In general, the Spanish army resembled the forces fielded by the European powers in the last decade leading up to the First World War. The great majority of the troops were unmotorized infantry using bolt-action rifles, supplemented by a relatively small number of machine guns and mortars. Supporting arms consisted mainly of horsed cavalry and horse-drawn artillery. Weapons associated with the onset of mechanized warfare, such as tanks and other armored vehicles, anti-tank and anti-aircraft guns, and motorized transport were present only in limited numbers and in undeveloped form. With this overall picture in mind, let's take a look at each arm in turn. As implied above, the greater part of the Spanish army consisted of infantry. Infantry organization was based on a battalion composed of three companies of riflemen and one armed with machine guns, with a heavy weapons platoon in support. This support platoon was usually armed with mortars, but some were armed with anti-tank guns like the 40mm Ariano. Two such battalions were combined to form a regiment. The established equipment strength of a regiment included provision for a third battalion to be raised in case of mobilization. Two regiments made a brigade, the two brigades made up a division, which in full strength could therefore put eight battalions into the field at peacetime establishment strength, which went up to 12 after wartime mobilization. Included in the divisional organization was a regiment of artillery, consisting of 12 batteries with four guns apiece. This could also be expanded in wartime like the infantry component to 18 batteries. A battalion of engineers, a squadron of cavalry, or sometimes bicycle troops, along with service and communications troops completed the organization of the infantry division. The core of the Peninsular Army consisted of eight infantry divisions of this kind. These were not exclusively tactical units, but also included territorial administrative units in their organization, exercising certain responsibilities over assigned military districts. Thus, the divisional commander was in charge not only of the division itself, but also of the administration of the district, in a way similar to that of the Wehrkreis organizations in the interwar German Reichswehr. Most of the army's formations in Spain were under strength in 1936, many of their soldiers on leave. The rumors of a possible military uprising had contributed to the ease with which this leave was granted. In addition to the divisional forces, there were three independent regiments based at the naval bases of Cadiz, Cartagena, and El Ferrol, two regiments under an independent command in Asturias, as well as four independent machine gun battalions. The island groups of the Balearics and Canaries were administratively part of the peninsula, and two regiments with supporting engineer and artillery units were stationed in each. The soldiers were armed mainly with 7mm Mauser M1893 bolt-action rifles. These were excellent weapons, and when used in the Spanish-American War, they had proven themselves superior to the rifles of the opposing U.S. Army. However, 40 years on, these guns were showing their age. A newer version, the M1916, was also in service, as well as short-barreled and carbine variants. The great majority of the approximately half a million rifles in army hands were varieties of the 7mm Mauser, but significant numbers of carbine-style rifles chambered for pistol rounds were also to be found. Most of these would be found in the hands of the paramilitary police, but they were also used by the cavalry. These included a Spanish copy of the Winchester Model 1892 using 4440 ammunition, known as El Tigre, and a 9mm Largo carbine dubbed the Destroyer. The original batch of Mausers employed by the Spanish were purchased from Germany, but most of the rifles in service in the 1930s were of domestic manufacture. As a result, they shared one of the common drawbacks of contemporary Spanish-produced small arms. Standardization of parts across Spanish manufacturers was very poor compared to those used in weapons produced by more advanced industrial nations. Thus, the same weapon produced by different gun makers, or even the same producer at different times, would often not use the same replacement parts. This inevitably made maintenance much more complicated, and many of these weapons were therefore of doubtful reliability. Even worse was the situation in regards to ammunition, 
were suffered in another way from the corruption and poverty prevailing in many areas of the service. Spent cartridge cases would be collected and refilled by contractors and then sold back to the Army, so that by the mid-1930s, most of the Spanish-made ammunition in the Army's hands consisted of refilled cartridges that had been recycled numerous times. These veteran cartridges were of wildly varying reliability, and misfires were so common that the much more dependable 7mm ammunition imported from Mexico was sought out and hoarded by the quartermasters of individual units when found. In the category of automatic weapons, the Spaniards had about 3,000 light machine guns, most of which were Hotchkiss M1922s. This weapon used a bipod and fired at the relatively slow rate of 300 rounds per minute. It was complemented in service by a heavier model, another Hotchkiss design, the M1914, which served as the standard heavy machine gun in Spanish infantry formations. This was a large tripod-mounted weapon weighing more than 100 pounds, or over 50 kilos. It was very commonly used by the French army during the First World War. The Spanish army had a little over 2,000 of these in 1936. Both of these machine guns were chambered for the same 7mm Mauser round used by the infantry rifle. This simplified ammunition supply would saddle the machine gunners with the same reliability issues as the rifleman. The Spanish infantry also used Valero mortars in 50, 60, and 81mm calibers. These were simple and reliable weapons on a par with their European contemporaries, though available in smaller numbers than would be the case elsewhere. The same could be said of the anti-tank gun available to the infantry. Small numbers of the Arellano 40mm gun were coming into use, but these were rare in peninsular units. There were also three brigades of specialized mountain infantry. These brigades differed from their counterparts in the regular infantry by their specialized training and equipment, adapted for operations in cold weather and difficult terrain, as well as for their lack of an integrated cavalry squadron. They did, however, still include integrated artillery regiments like the regular infantry division, which in this case were equipped with 105mm Schneider M1919 mountain guns. Like other mountain guns, these differed from regular artillery in their lighter weight and by being designed to be disassembled into sections more easily transported along steep and narrow trails. As might be expected, these mountain brigades were stationed in the Pyrenees along the border with France. An irregularly constituted mountain unit was also on the Spanish order of battle. This is made up of two infantry regiments stationed in Asturias mentioned above. Though these regiments were drawn from the regular infantry, they were used in operations to maintain government control of the rugged districts in which the 1934 revolt had taken place, and were given a regiment of mountain guns to support their occupation-like operation there. The core of Spanish artillery was somewhat more modern, but it was small and shared the general backwardness and neglect found throughout the rest of the peninsular forces. This had not always been the case. The artillery had historically been a highly professional body with a considerable esprit de corps, but the corruption unavoidable upon involvement with the prevailing political culture led some high-ranking artillery officers to stage an abortive coup against the Primo de Rivera regime in 1926. This attempt, a response to the promotions issue mentioned above, attracted little support and was suppressed without incident. As a result, the artillery lost its status as an independent arm of the service and was subordinated to the infantry, and their established professional body, the Royal Regiment of Artillery, was suspended. Artillery forces not included in the infantry and cavalry formations in the peninsula consisted of four independent regiments of field artillery and four of heavy artillery. The field units were equipped with the same weapons as the artillery components of the infantry divisions. This consisted of equal numbers of World War I-era French 75mm M06 Schneider field guns, and Spanish-made Vickers 105mm M22 howitzers. The heavy batteries fielded 150mm Krupp M13 and Schneider 155mm M17 howitzers. In addition to the field artillery, there were four coastal defense regiments, with headquarters at the principal naval bases on the mainland and at Mahon on the Balearic Islands. These used a wide variety of heavy guns of varying size and age, some of them naval artillery removed from previous generations of Spanish warships. The Spanish were very weak in anti-aircraft artillery, as they were in most of the specialist weapons needed to wage modern mechanized warfare. This was one of the areas in which the pre-Civil War army was weakest, and their total inventory of flak weapons consisted of two batteries of 76.5mm Czech-built Skoda M1919s, with eight guns per battery. One division and three regiments of horse cavalry were included in the Spanish army. These units were useful in many of the policing actions carried out during peacetime. Given the generally poor nature of the Spanish transportation infrastructure, they were invaluable for their mobility. In combat, these would of course dismount and fight on foot. Cavalry division organization was similar to that of the infantry division, based on battalions made up of two regular squadrons and a machine gun squadron. The cavalry division included an artillery regiment equipped with 75mm Schneider guns, as well as two squadrons of armored cars.
Armored units proper were another category of modern arms in which the Spanners were critically weak. One battalion of armored cars was based at Haranjue, using Spanish-built Bilbao-type armored cars. Tank units were limited to two battalions based at Madrid and Zaragoza. These were equipped with a total of 16 ex-French World War I machines, six Schneider CA-1 turretless landship types, and ten smaller Renault FTs, turrets mounting machine guns only. These tanks had been acquired in the 1920s to fight against Abdel Krim's rebellion in Morocco, and were of dubious mechanical reliability in the mid-1930s. In any case, either type was little more than a death trap on a 1930s battlefield against any kind of up-to-date opponent. The bulk of the Spanish Air Force, which was organizationally part of the army, was also stationed in the peninsula. The air unit shared in the generally poor maintenance status of the rest of the Spanish Air Forces. On paper, the Spanish fighter force consisted of five 12 plane squadrons, three based at the capital, one in Seville, and two more in Barcelona. These used the Newport NI-52, a Spanish-built version of a mid-1920s French design. The Newports were slow, outdated and poorly armed, no match for contemporary European fighters, and at least two full generations behind the newer types being introduced into service with the leading nations. None of the squadrons were at establishment strength, and few of the Newports were in flying condition anywhere in the country. In addition, three unarmed Hawker Fury biplane fighters were on hand in Guadalajara. These had been delivered as models to facilitate planned Spanish production at the Hispano Suiza plant there. A few other examples of foreign aircraft, such as an American Boeing P-26 and the British Bristol Bulldog, were also to be found in Spanish hands as a result of similar purchasing or licensing agreements with manufacturers. The most numerous aircraft in Spanish service was of similar vintage. It was another French design, the Brigade 19, a two-place reconnaissance-slash-light bomber aircraft intended to act in an army cooperation role. This was a type common among European and American air services in the interwar years, and the Brigade served in several other air forces in a similar role. Spanish operated 11 squadrons, of which 10 were based in the peninsula and one in Africa. Aside from a few Dornio Wall flying boats and Fokker F-7 transport planes, these were the total strength of the Spanish Air Force in 1936. The Spanish Navy had three squadrons of Vickers Vildebuse biplane torpedo bombers, and a squadron of Martinside F-4 biplane floatplane fighters of little value, as well as a couple dozen Savoia Marchetti SM-62 and Dornier Wall flying boats for reconnaissance. Turning to Africa, the units stationed here formed the core of the effective strength of the Spanish Army. The most capable and aggressive officers were drawn here by the lure of action and possible rapid promotion. The colonial situation attracted ambitious men seeking a strenuous life in a hard country, it tempted them with the chance of danger and glory. The territory itself was arid, sparsely populated, and featured mountainous areas. It consisted of a narrow strip along the Mediterranean coast, extending inland where it met the much larger French territory of Morocco. Another narrow strip of territory extended from the coast inland along the southern border of the same French territory. The southern zone, known as the Cabo Yupi territory, was much emptier than the northern zone. To the south of this strip extended the other big African colony under Spanish rule, the Spanish Sahara. This consisted of a strip of coast beginning opposite the Canary Islands and extending for some distance inland. The tiny coastal enclave of Ifni, some distance to the north of Cabo Yubi, completes the list of Spanish possessions in Africa. The only significant towns in all of these territories were in the northern zone of Spanish Morocco. These were Sueta, directly opposite Gibraltar, Malia, to the territory's eastern coast, and Tetuan, the administrative capital of all the African colonies, situated in the western end of the coastal strip some distance south of Sueda. Spain had exercised jurisdictions over small enclaves of the African side of the strait, namely the presidios of Sueda, Melilla, and Florache, for centuries, dating back to the days of Columbus and the final wars of the Reconquista. The modern protectorate just described had been granted to the Spanish in the 1912 Treaty of Fez. This agreement, negotiated with the French, to find the precise extent and nature of the spheres of influence the two powers exercised in the area. For most of the period since its formation, the colony was governed by a high commissioner, who was usually a military man. Theoretically, the country was under the sovereignty of the Moroccan Sultan, whose regime continued to handle most of the functions of the civil power. The presence of Spanish civilians in the territories was small, and concentrated in the larger towns. Spanish Morocco, then, was effectively a military reservation, under army control and usually of little interest to the rest of the Spanish population. The most valuable economic resource in the colony were the iron mines of the Rif. These were located in the mountain chains of the eastern part of Spanish Morocco. Fighting that raged in the colony and formed the chief occupation of the Spanish soldiers of the 1920s was in part an effort to secure the undisputed Spanish control over these valuable ore fields. 
The persistent fighting against the forces of the Rift Rebels here intensified after the First World War and led to the establishment of a separatist regime under indigenous leaders, which was known as the Rift Republic. This was able to maintain a precarious independence under its leader Abdel Krim from 1921 until its final defeat in 1927 at the hands of the Spanish, acting in concert with the French. The long war in the Protectorate was extremely unpopular with the people of Spain, and the resentment of the expense and conscription involved was a key factor in the downfall of the constitutional monarchy and the subsequent military dictatorship of Primo de Rivera. The Army of Africa included units of service troops, such as quartermasters and medical-slash-veterinarian facilities, as well as communications and other auxiliaries. A small contingent of the Air Force was also present. This consisted of a squadron of Brigade 19 Army Cooperation Planes at Tetuan, and a unit of transports and flying boats in the Cabo Yubi Territory. Regular Spanish conscript infantry, which were here known as Casadores, also formed a major part of the forces here. They were used mainly for defensive uses such as garrison duty and rear area security, and it was they who manned most of the fortifications in the Protectorate. The units in Africa generally had better equipment and supplies than their peninsular counterparts, and what they had was kept in better condition. The hard core of the African army, however, was composed of units of two special corps which had no counterpart in the peninsular army. These were the Tercio, or the Spanish Foreign Legion, and the Regularis. The Tercio had been created in the 1920s as a response to the very poor performance of Spanish conscript units in the fighting against the Rift Rebels. In general, the Tercio formed the vanguard of the Spanish army in Africa. Their partners in this role were the Regularis, a slightly older organization, recruited from among the warlike inhabitants of the Northern Territory. The Legion and the Regularis brought together the recent enemies from the Rift War, formed the cutting edge of the Spanish army. The Regularis, or more properly the Fuerzas Regularis Indigenous, were units of soldiers raised from the Spanish Moroccan subjects. They were the organizational descendants of the indigenous battalions recruited in the early years of the century as the Spanish consolidated their hold on the territory surrounding their established coastal presidios. Ready recruits were found among the many experienced raiders and fighters in the colony, whose loose political and justice system included a good deal of scope for the kind of low-intensity conflict that is often endemic to societies without a central authority to keep order. The regularis were originally meant to act as scouts and light auxiliaries, but their mission expanded to include more of a conventional infantry role. These men were organized into units known as tabors, a term which had long been used to denote small fighting units in Morocco. These were the equivalent of a small battalion when applied to infantry or a squadron when referring to cavalry. The majority of the regularis were foot soldiers, with a ratio of two infantry to each cavalry tabor. Up until the mid-1920s, the regularis, like the tercio, had been a force composed entirely of foot soldiers, cavalry units having been created during the fighting against Abdel Krim's rebellion. Like many colonial units employed by European powers, units of the regularis lacked their own organic artillery and other heavy weapons. The men were tough, long-service professionals. Their origins as scouts and rangers was still reflected in the 30s in their well-attested proficiency for stealthy movement and the skillful use of terrain, especially the exploitations of zones of dead ground to conduct undetected approaches on enemy positions. Often these units were selected to carry out irregular actions such as raids behind enemy lines or other guerrilla-type operations. The Spanish Foreign Legion was established in 1920. This was a unit of long-service professional troops formed to serve in the colony in response to the generally dismal performance of Spanish conscripts in actions against the Rift Rebels. Their organization was partially modeled on that of the more famous French Foreign Legion. Much recruitment was based on an appeal of desperate men who had no place in their society, or those of the past which they wished to escape. The Legion would ask no questions of its recruits, and even allowed men to enlist under assumed names following the French practice. The Legion offered a path of honorable redemption to these men in exchange for blind obedience and a willingness to die in the Spanish cause. This was a powerful attraction to a certain kind of man, and these were then subjected to a form of discipline which included an element of fanatical Catholicism centered around a kind of cult of death. The Legionaries called themselves Novios de Morte, or the Bridegrooms of Death, and went into battle with the cry of Viva la Morte, or Long Live Death. Like its French counterpart, it accepted men without regard to nationality. Men from all over the world would join, but foreign nationals would always constitute only a small minority, and the bulk of the Legion's personnel were always Spanish. The founder of the Legion and the architect of its ethos was José Melanostre, a battered veteran whose sometimes maniacal utterances combined with his main body could have been used as a model for a cartoon character meant to represent the spirit of militarism. One-eyed, one-legged, and one-armed, this narrow and ruthless man had once been involved in a very public dispute with one of the greatest Spanish intellectuals of the day, Miguel de Unamuno. This incident so perfectly sums up one aspect of the conflict raging in Spanish society at the time that is worth briefly relating here. 
This occurred at a celebration of the Fiesta Nacional on October 12, 1936, at the University of Salamanca. This was three weeks after the rebellion, and this institution, of which Unamuno was the rector, now lay in army-controlled territory. A writer, who was a member of the Falange, or the Spanish Fascist Party, concluded a speech in the crowd, which included many fascists and their sympathizers, began cheering and chanting. Prominent among these noisemakers was Milan Estray, whose enthusiastic war cry, Viva la Marte, could be heard over the crowd, and was taken up by it. Unamuno, a world-renowned intellectual and no friend of the rebels, was the speaker to follow. In a very gentle voice, he made response to this terrifying display, which included this quote, It torments me to think that General Milan Estray might dictate the norms of the psychology of the masses. It should be expected from a mutilated one who lacks the spiritual greatness of a Cervantes to find a horrible solace in seeing the number of the mutilated multiply around him. The general, purple with rage, howled back, death to intelligence, long live death, and the cry was taken up by the fascists, and Nuno Muno retired from the stage amid a chorus of threats and abuse. Only his worldwide fame and the protection given him by Franco's wife, who was an admirer, saved the philosopher from a death sentence for his statements. He was to die anyway a couple months later, broken-hearted and under house arrest. With him died some part of the old, romantic, tragic part of the Spanish character. Milan Estray and his spirit animated the ethos of the Spanish Legion. They were the elite of the Spanish forces, and many of the highest-ranking officers in Spanish service were either members or had served crucial periods of the military career in its ranks. Its level of professionalism was much higher than the normal of Spanish infantry, and its equipment was the best available. I'll be talking a lot more about the Legion, which I consider to be one of the more interesting phenomena of Spanish militarism, in a future episode. The combination of these two forces into the heart of the Spanish Army of Africa represents a historical confluence of motivations and action. Here, the two most disciplined and warlike sections of the population join forces to impose their will upon the rest of the society. The common spirit of the Moroccans and the legionaries are reflected in the legion's formal title, the Tercio de Extranjeros, or more commonly simply the Tercio. This term, which means one-third, was the term used to denote the units of musketeers and pikemen which dominated the battlefields of Europe during the 16th and 17th centuries. This was the golden age of Spanish arms, when her soldiers were the terror of all Europe and the Americas. The conquerors of that age had been motivated by a militant Catholicism that was distinctly medieval in character. The esprit de corps of the Legion was modeled on this intolerant and fanatical crusading spirit, and this neo-medievalism found a useful complement in the semi-nomadic warrior ethos of the Moroccans and the Regularis units serving alongside. Both held similar ideas of manhood, based on a traditional warrior virtues of stoicism, self-denial, endurance, courage, and contempt for wounds and death. The sinister side of this type of martial virtue would be exhibited in a corresponding ruthlessness and brutality. This kind of warrior ethos too often includes a contempt for the weak and defeated, which very easily justifies abuse of the powerless, including torture and arbitrary slaughter. Both the Legion and the Regulares would earn a reputation for savagery, whether in combat or not. Horrifying stories of indiscriminate atrocities against combatants and civilians, even against friendly civilians, followed these units wherever they operated. Nor was this denied or regretted. In fact, this barbaric reputation was consciously cultivated as a means of intimidation. The black soldiers serving with the Regulares in particular were used to terrify the rebels' opponents. They were often referred to as the Moors by all sides in the coming conflict, a usage calculated to invoke the historical fear of the Muslim enemies of the Spanish in the Middle Ages. More common was the straightforward use of racist depictions of these black soldiers, which made the reputation for barbarism all the more plausible. Threats of, quote, turning loose these soldiers on the army's political opponents were often used to unnerve their enemies. This often included threats of sexual violence, as when the rebel general Capo Delano announced over Radio Seville that he had, quote, promised to deliver the women of Madrid to the Moroccans. On the other side of the political divide, much was made of these kind of threats by government propagandists to expose the hypocrisy of a nationalist patriotic movement's use of the, quote, traditional enemies of Spain and the Catholic Church against the legitimate Spanish government and the Spanish people themselves in their so-called crusade of national regeneration. Almost all of the Army of Africa was stationed in the Moroccan Protectorate, which was divided into Western and Eastern departments, which are known as commandancias. Forces in the Eastern Commandancia consisted of three banderas, or battalions, of the Legion, the two tabors of Regularis. These were supported by a regiment of Cazadores, composed of two rifle battalions and a machine gun battalion, and an artillery regiment with six four-gun batteries of 105mm guns. Auxiliary forces here included a company of marines and two company-sized units of the Mehala, 
This was the paramilitary police force of the Moroccan Sultanate, which was placed by the Sultan under the orders of the Spanish army. The headquarters of the Eastern Commandancia was located in the town of Melilla. The Western Department had three banderas of the Legion, two tabors of Regulares, and one regiment each of Cazadors and artillery in the Tetuan Sueto area. Another tabor of Regulares and another Cazador regiment were based near the town of Larache. In this district, the Moroccan Mehala units were also attached to Spanish forces, and these totaled three companies. Small units of locally recruited infantry forces were present in the Spanish Sahara and in the Enclave of Ifni. These were administratively part of the Army of Africa, but seemed to have been employed locally only. These forces round out the Spanish military presence in northwest Africa. To complete the picture of the Spanish army on the eve of the Civil War, mention must be made of the paramilitary law enforcement services maintained by the Spanish government. The men of these forces, whose organizations existed to combat various forms of civil disorder and class struggle, very often had a much greater degree of fighting experience than the conscripts of the provincial garrisons. Especially in the early stages of the conflict, the armed police would often be the most effective combatants involved in particular actions, and their participation on one side or the other would be crucial in determining the results of the initial coup in more than a few Spanish towns. In 1936, these police forces were the second most effective combat forces maintained by the Spanish state. They were more formidable than the bulk of the army's units, and second only to the troops of the Army of Africa. This should be taken as a general statement only, however. Often, the test of combat would prove these men to be useless cowards whose martial competence extended no further than bullying unarmed peasants or factory workers. The above-mentioned Guardia Civil, or the Civil Guards, were formed in the 1840s as a means of dealing with the increasing amount of civil disorder and organized resistance occurring in the countryside. They were usually mounted and armed in the same manner as the Army's cavalry, with some indication that automatic small arms such as machine pistols and submachine guns were more common in their service. As previously mentioned, civil guards soon gained a reputation for brutality and were violently hated by much of the population, to whom they were little more than the hired thugs of the landowners and political bosses. The assault guards, or Guardia de Asalto, were much more recent innovation established by the Second Republic. Commonly called assaltos, these men had a similar job to the civil guards, but were intended for use in an urban setting. They were founded as a response to the increasing degree of organization among left-wing industrial workers, and were intended to combat the anarchists and other leftist unions, many of which maintained an armed wing. The last paramilitary force, the Carabineros, were the oldest, dating back to 1829. They were a customs enforcement force operating as part of the finance ministry that exercised powers which in the American system would be delegated to the Treasury and the Coast Guard. They were probably the most professional and certainly the most apolitical of the state paramilitaries. All of these paramilitaries were armed only with small arms, a fair number of them automatic, they were not intended for heavy combat on a battlefield, and lacked heavy machine guns or any kind of artillery. The total number of Spaniards serving in these forces is estimated to be approximately equal to the number serving in the army, namely 100 to 125,000. And so that will conclude our brief summary of the state of the Spanish army in 1936. I hope you found some of what I had to say here interesting or useful. I also hope that it will serve as an adequate background for some of the upcoming episodes on the Spanish Civil War. This army was the matrix out of which both sides in that war would form their own armed forces, and its motivations and structure helped put the subsequent developments in a little bit better context. Next time I talk to you about Spain, I'll be covering the last months of the Republic and the revolt itself, and the division and transformation of these forces. Next time, however, I'm going to look across the Atlantic at developments occurring in the United States armed forces while the Spanish crisis was brewing. So I hope you join me for that. That being said, I remain Mark Seven, wishing you all the best.